Pues yo digo que no, porque no, no aguantó, no, no es como quiera, ¿verdad? No es como quiera. But as the widow told Fikes more about the time Castaneda had spent with her husband, he began to realize the true value of Castaneda's research. She was very willing to tell me everything that she knew about Castaneda. Nunca preguntaba ni ni hizo entrevistas como nosotros. Pues no, oía pues, pero no preguntaba de nada. She said he didn't learn anything significant about the Huichol. That's the way she put it. Above all, it became clear that Castaneda could never have been a shaman's apprentice. Huichol apprentices had to go on five annual pilgrimages where they made offerings to their ancestors before harvesting peyote. These pilgrimages required long periods of abstinence. She told me that he was too interested in women to be able to go on a peyote hunt because during that pilgrimage there's no sex, there's no bathing, there's no salt, there's fasting. And she told me he couldn't stand uh, giving up all those things that, uh, that a non-shaman values. Now that he was certain that the Huichol were the model for Don Juan, Fikes realized the extent of Castaneda's deception. He totally made stuff up when it came to the peyote rituals. There's no doubt in my mind it's all fabricated. Seeing the peyote spirit, predicting the future, turning into a crow. These were all inventions, as was Castaneda's spiritual mentor, Don Juan. I think Castaneda perpetrated the greatest hoax in anthropology since the Piltdown Man hoax. The Piltdown Man was not a true fossil, it was a concoction. And Castaneda did the same thing. He took bits and pieces of reality and fused them with fabricated things and put it out there as if it were true. And he's up there among the best con artists in history. But did it really matter if Castaneda had fictionalized his fieldwork? When news of the hoax broke, some argued that his research still had value, even if the details were inaccurate. To me, there are too many universal truths embodied in what Castaneda reveals. So whether or not every conversation was you know, a faithfully recorded conversation, uh, I don't think is the point. I think the real question that we have to ask is, now, how does Castaneda expand our understanding of human nature, of reality? But the idea that this was a victimless crime is simply not true. For a start, Castaneda's false depiction of the Yaqui way of life made him a millionaire, but left the Yaqui people themselves even more misunderstood. Castaneda's works have been bothersome to Yaqui people because they still have people actually looking for Don Juan. And the first thing that's out of her mouth is Castaneda's work and how familiar they are with the Yaqui way of life, which is not reflective at all in terms of how we are. There's a richer side to our life and how we live and what we believe that people don't give us credit for. According to Fikes, Castaneda's work has been even more damaging for the Huichol. For them, hallucinogenic plants have deep cultural and religious significance, whereas Castaneda had popularized their use as the route to personal enlightenment and ecstasy. As a result, the Huichol were inundated with hippies on the hunt for peyote. The authorities soon became involved. Have you taken it? Yeah. What does it do for you? Ah, uh, it's a trip. Fikes claims that as a result of the hippie invasion, the Mexican and American governments clamped down on the use of peyote. It's a part of the cactus family. It's a hallucinogenic plant. What will happen to these people now? Well, we'll turn them over to the 
County Authority. Tell all the people that you see. This clampdown didn't just affect the hippies. It struck at the heart of the Huichol culture. Castaneda's work was having a negative impact on real American Indians and Mexican Indian people. Their people were being put into prison during the peyote pilgrimages because of these outsiders, these hippies that were interfering. And so Castaneda had done a lot of damage. The charge is Castaneda had transgressed one of the most sacred rules in anthropology. He had caused terrible damage to the people he went to observe. But it did not end there. Castaneda's deception was about to have catastrophic consequences in his own culture. Living in LA during the 1980s and 90s, Castaneda increasingly withdrew from public life, never allowing himself to be photographed or interviewed. In his private classes, his claims became even more extreme. He now declared that like Don Juan, he would not die a mortal death. Instead, he would turn into pure energy and disappear into infinity, taking his followers with him. Well, he made all sorts of just totally incredible claims. He had claimed he was going to take a group of people with him off into infinity, and they were going to die, and they weren't going to leave their bodies behind. And um, at the time, that and it seemed like it might be plausible. You would be able to travel among galaxies and constellations and black holes and planets. And it wouldn't be your body anymore, it's your awareness that's able to, to take in all of this magnificence. Greg and Gabby became increasingly concerned about some of Castaneda's teachings. In particular, his suggestion that his followers cut themselves off from friends and relatives. It was a classic cult formation. These were people that had severed ties with, with their family and friends. They all changed their names. They changed their names like dirty underwear. I dreaded the moment where Carlos would tell me to relinquish the relationship to my daughter because I would never do it. You know, that was one thing I would never do. Greg and Gabby decided to turn detective. Mounting a surveillance operation, they followed their guru's every move. Night after night, they trailed his car through the streets of Los Angeles, sometimes losing him, but picking up the search the next day. Castaneda had kept his address a secret, but by following him, they finally found his home. Well, we're on the corner of Pandora and Eastbourne, and we parked in the spot and this corner was good because we could, we had the advantage point of seeing the gap in the hedge on Pandora and also we were able to see their driveway on Eastbourne so we were able to see any vehicle as it was arriving or leaving. No one had ever filmed Castaneda before but from their vantage point Greg and Gabby finally succeeded. Now in his 70s Castaneda claimed to live a solitary and celibate life, but it soon became clear this was far from the truth. Two of his closest disciples, Florinda Donner and Taisha Abelar, shared the house, and a third woman visited regularly. These women were always at Castaneda's side, and were known to his followers as the witches. all look like little boys. <laughs> he, he had this thing about women looking like little boys. Searching for more clues, 
Greg and Gabby took the drastic step of raiding Castaneda's trash. The reams of receipts they found showed that far from living the frugal life he claimed, he was showering the witches with expensive gifts and designer clothes. But a more shocking discovery was yet to come. An internet search came up with marriage certificates indicating that Castaneda had married two of the witches in the space of one week. Carlos Castaneda, their great spiritual guru, was a bigamist.